John Trudell welcoming you to Radio Free Alcatraz, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Indians of all tribes. Tonight we'll be speaking with Mrs. Stella Leach and Mr. Gabriel Sharp and Mr. Raymond Spang. Mrs. Leach is a member of the Colville Sioux Tribes. She's a registered nurse and a council member on the island. She runs the clinic here on the island, and she took, took a three-month leave of absence from her job at the Well Baby Clinic in San Francisco to work with the people on the island. She's been here with Al Operation Alcatraz from the very beginning. And Mr. Gabriel Sharp is a Mojave, and he's a member of the Colorado River Tribes of Parker, Arizona. His occupation is he's a counselor for Indian high school students, the assistant director of, of All Indian Upward Bound Program at the Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, and he's a chairman of education for the Arizona Indian Association. And Ray Spang is a Northern Cheyenne, 19 years old. He's a student at UCLA, taking sociology, mental health, and law. And he's a member of the council here on the island, and he was a member of the invading group the 20th of November and I will start off the questioning with Ray. Ray, what would you uh, like to see take place on the island? Yeah, well, I think I'd, rather, I'd like to see a Native American university which would include not only classroom discussion but actually involve the students and the teachers going out to the communities and relating we're trying to make their education, what they learn in the classroom, relevant and, you know, going out in the field and seeing how stuff works. And, you know, just relating or tying the two together rather than, see, like, I'm from Montana and I went out to, uh, out east for a while. And I was, you know, completely cut off from my tribe and the people back home, I didn't know what was going on. But then if I see down in L.A., then I got the community around there and get involved in that. And we can work with the community and they can have a direct say over what the students at the university do and sort of tie in the two together and work from there, rather than, you know, having them go on their way and we go on our way, and hopefully, you know, by another time, ten, 10 years or so, we'll meet somewhere or other. Uh, Stella? Yes. Say. What would I like to see on Alcatraz? I'd like to see the dreams of all these young people that took this island come true. If the university is what they want, then I'm all for it. Whatever pleases our young people, because to me this is the greatest thing that has ever occurred in my generation to these young people. To see our Indian youth take their place in society and once again become warriors in our society, men in the world. Uh, Mr. Sharp, same question. Uh, what I would like to see um, Alcatraz become uh, would be in the minds of the, those people called Native Americans. I believe that uh, uh, we, are, we are always talking about dreams. Some people call dreams dreams and some people call these dreams imagination. And by the, our mind power, and thoughts we can create. I see a beautiful dream here on Alcatraz in terms of a piece of earth that God gave to the Indians, will revert back to the Indians, and out of this will grow something positive that really is Indians, that belongs to the Indians, and it's not a government control or state control or uh, controlled by other peoples, but something that really belongs to the Indian himself. I, this is a, a dream that uh, I feel that uh, some of these youngsters uh, uh, came on this idea to create, came on this island to create, to work with these ideas, and it's a beautiful dream. I'd like to go back to what Stella mentioned about this is the first time that we have done anything as a group while well, the youth have gotten together. And why do you th uh, think that we have, uh, we ha this is our, the first time that we have ever really gotten together and done something in the national eye so that the public is aware of what we are doing, the circumstances leading up to this? Well, in my lifetime, I've always found that the bureaucracies that controlled the Indians' destiny 
has always impressed upon the Indian that they could never get together. The tribes, there was such a basic difference between our tribal cultures and our philosophies that we could never unite. Well, here on this island, you can see about 70 different tribes working with each other in friendship and complete cooperation. And of course, this is very, very fascinating to me to prove to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other establishments that once again they are wrong, that Indians primarily are the same. We are all Indians underneath, regardless of our culture or our geography. Yeah, I did some reading on this, uh, some books on Indians, and I read that the government started a policy several decades ago, a couple hundred years ago, of breaking down the Indian, not only as a nation, but as a tribe, as a family, as an individual, and uh, they did this job, and they accomplished what they set out to do very well for a certain period of time. But I like to believe that uh, they, took, they took our lands away. I don't like to believe this, but they did take our lands. But I like to believe that, that we haven't been defeated. That, uh, and this, I think this is the first really big chance we've had to show that we're still together and that we're willing to work together. And this is something that other people have got to learn to do. And it's taken us a long time. And there's a lot for us to do, but I, we're in the right direction. Ray, do you have any comments to add to this? Well, I don't know. I don't like to think of ourselves as being defeated either. And I look as you know, look at things up factually, because you know, the United States has stolen land, and they still are stealing land. And they're still got the reservations. They still have prejudiced teachers. The educational standards are what on the fifth grade level. I mean, after 400 years, on a fifth grade level. Uh, we get the lowest death rate, and you know all these statistics. And people say, you know, they think of them as being in the past century. They say, well, my dad, my dad might, have, you know, participated. My grandfather might have, but not today, you know. But if you go back to any of the reservations and just look around, live there for a week, and you know, you find out it's true. It's, you know, it's it's really bad. And about this dying out. See, like we've been here for 20,000 years before the white men ever came. In 400 years and what 70 some years he's been here and only in the last 50 years has he's really taken over you know with the factories the pollution cars smog birth control pills uh, then the race question is coming up and see in 50 years the white man has really messed up and we've been here all along and we're still here you know so there has to be some value because you know after they subjugated us and divided us and beat us down and beat us over the head with a Christian cross and things we still have our culture after 400 years I mean, you know, where else is there another people who has been so, so subjugated and so small and yet still retain so much? The only other people I can think of that would fit into this category would be the, the Jewish people. And uh, they have seemed to, what it has taken them about 400 years to kind of get things going for them. But that's the only other people I know of this really happening with that have taken a lot from a lot of uh, harassment, I guess, from other peoples and other races, because we as a nation have suffered more. We're the only people to ever fight the United States government and suffer and pay for it continuously, even though the wars are supposedly long gone and over. We're, we pay for it every day. And uh, I would like Mr. Sharp to, he was talking on the boat on the way over here today about an incident that happened with Lee Brightman, and I would like to have Mr. Sharp uh, give us the details on this. Uh, Mr. Brightman came over to Arizona. Um, I believe it was uh, sometime in uh, November. Uh, he got an invitation from, from the Phoenix area. And uh, he, um, I, I work at the university in <clears throat> one of the offices, one of the Indian offices, so uh, uh, Mr. Brightman came to our office. Uh, he was um, a fellow Indian, brought him over, <clears throat> and he talked to my boss. Uh, I'm assistant director of the Up All Indian Upward Bound, and my boss is the director. <laughs> so I won't mention names here, but after Mr. Brightman left our office, uh, we got a call from the hierarchy of the university 
uh, wanting to know who invited this guy. Uh, uh, the most in another interesting part to this is uh, Mr. Brightman was taken over to the Indian Community Action Program uh, office, which deals uh, works with Indians uh, in Arizona, in California, and uh, New Mexico, and uh, the uh, uh, with the got a call from the governor's office, the governor of Arizona. Uh, uh, one of his boys uh, called down to the uh, Indian Community Action Headquarters wanting to know who invited this uh, Mr. Brightman. And also that uh, a suggestion was made that, uh, that uh, the Indians in Arizona were being treated very well. Uh, and this, this was quite interesting to me because I've been working in Indian Affairs uh, for a number of years and I've lived on reservations and, and I've seen uh, some of the conditions uh, there on, on reservations, on the Havasupai Reservation. I, I was working there for a number of years in the bottom of the Grand Canyon and you would see a five-year-old youngster for having for breakfast a uh, a dried up old tortilla that they had the night before and a cup of coffee. Uh, and this would go on morning after morning. And uh, I, was, I guess uh, at that time I lived in a nice white house and boy did my conscience bother me. Well this type of conditions exist all over in, in Arizona in, in some of the 17 reservations there. And uh, but I think that uh, well, the most interesting part was the comment saying that uh, Arizona Indians are being helped. After people trying to help Arizona Indians uh, since the Indian Reorganization Act and since the, we greeted the pilgrims, uh, we still haven't gotten any place. I just, I just wonder if who is really trying to help who. It's a very, very good question there. Uh, we have to take a uh about a 10 second pause here for station identification and this broadcast is being brought by the Pacifica Network and now local stations will identify themselves. KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley. Okay, we're back here. We're with uh, Stella Leach, Mr. Gabriel Sharp, and Raymond Spang. And I think uh, better explain who Lee Brightman is. Stella, you're a little more familiar with Lee. Would you care to? Well, Lee uh, heads the United Native, Native American Group, and which is comprised uh, primarily of uh, college and university level students. He is one of the most well-known activists, I think, in the United States. And uh, his main interest, of course, is the betterment of his people, not only through the educational level, but also through, so through the uh, nutritional and uh, health levels. I've only heard Mr. Brightman speak one time. This was at the California Educational Forum for California Indians in Riverside about, about a month ago. And he's a very effective speaker. He gets his point across. Yeah, he gets while he's doing this, and so perhaps that's what the governor of Arizona was concerned about. Maybe he was afraid his toes were going to be stepped on. Uh, uh, Mr. Sharp uh, brought up the point about who is helping who. And uh, there are many well-meaning people, I think, out on the outside society that want to, would like to help us, and maybe in many ways don't know how. But it seems to me that uh, we have two different cultures, and many people that want to help, help the Indian people, they want, to, they want to help us, but they want us to do it their way. They don't want to give us any free hand and let us work on our own. They don't seem to realize that we have brains and feelings and we're human beings and we can function just as well as anyone else. You know, we're not uh, gods, but we're not devils. We're just everyday human beings with a culture and a history of our own that we would like to be able to bring out. Have you ever run into any well-meaning people, Ray, that uh, have maybe kind of loused things up? Yeah, well, I think I ran into a lot and most common are the type of what the um, well-to-do rich white lady who went, you know, whose husband has a big car, and you know, 2.4 children, things like this, and she usually, you know, goes around with her society friends and you know, 
clicking up ten dollars here and there and then sending it to some organization or to some family or even to some uh, reservation but then on the reservation you don't, you don't know what happens to it it's either uh, ripped off in the tribal council or you know some other people get their hands into it then you know it really doesn't get down where it's going and the people really interested in getting the money out there they would get themselves together and also when they organize they shouldn't go around saying well we're going to save the Indian people you know they should just do about it quietly and matter of factly and get it done and another thing is um, when there comes a plea from some reservation for help one of the most the first things they send is a lot of used old clothing and you know <laughs> it's going to cover up our reservation so we don't need that it's, and some of the tribes are even kicking around the idea of starting a ceremony called the old clothes burning ceremony in many cases uh, that's about the only way some of these old clothes will keep us warm too it's just have a big bonfire and get them all out of the way at once. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, or Mr. Sharp, you're as an educator, what do you think about our educational program here and what we are setting up? I, I've been reading over what the, the proposal here and uh, the potential is there. The uh, Center for Native uh, American Studies, uh, it's great. It's a great idea. Let me give you a, a specific example of, uh, of what we do in working with uh, high school students, uh, sophomore to senior level, uh, between ages and 15 to 20. Uh, <clears throat> I think that somewhere along this line you can, uh, there are a, a lot of Indian students who have been going to school, public school, and don't really know what their, their, their tribes are. and. Uh, Every human being has to answer the question to within himself. He has to know, who am I? You know, uh, who, who am I? What is my purpose on this earth? You know, I, I think uh, all we Indians know what our purpose is, and we know what our potential is. This is what makes us so in harmony and so so relaxed. Now, uh, I think that uh, along your proposals here, uh, the, it's it's tremendous. Uh, you have here uh, uh, an American Indian Spiritual Center. Uh, I could go in, into this for hours because I have been uh, indoctrinated into the spiritual realm of uh, Mojave philosophy. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess some, I hate to use this word, but white people believe in heaven. Uh, we Indians know there's more than one heaven. <laughs> there's about four, and the Navajo's... Uh, uh, more uh, seven heavens and the hope is twelve. My goodness, you know. So uh, th there's an area to be explored. Uh, uh, oh, I, I just can't talk enough about this. The American Indian Museum. This is an an, an idea that that is present on all reservations. Uh, this the idea is always there. It, it's um, I think that this would be a. a uh, I just can't say enough about this. Uh, the potential is here, and I love the idea and. And it's going to work uh, in terms of education. There's no limit. There is no limit. Thank you. Uh, Stella, uh, would you please tell us uh, how you happened to be here and when you first found out about the Alcatraz movement? Well, I was aware for some time that our young people were planning on landing on Alcatraz. And, of course, I was all in favor of this. I didn't feel that at my age that I would take part in any of this. But on the second day after the landing, I uh, felt that perhaps some of our people may need medical attention. So with the assistance of Dr. Tepper, who is uh, the uh, director of our All Indian Well Baby Clinic in Oakland, we fixed up first aid kits and I attempted to come aboard the island. Of course, at that time the blockade was on and I had to come in escorted by the United States Marshal. And uh, so shortly after I arrived, well, the clinic was put in commission and uh, we found that there was a need for it here because then the families began to come onto the island and more and more people were getting through the blockade. And of course, food and water situation was quite serious for the first four or five days. And uh, so I stayed. And uh, finally, I got a three months leave of absence and uh, remained on the island permanently. And, uh, of course, my employer, Dr. Tepper, has since then 
uh, given one day a week to our clinic here on the island, and uh, it might be interesting to the people that are listening to know that we have a doctor that comes every day, and uh, six of these doctors are Jewish, and the seventh one is a Greek, Dr. Chalice, and uh, these are all people that have come from an oppressed background, and I feel that they are sympathetic to us, and this is the reason that they have participated so wholeheartedly. And of course, there are other do doctors and nurses in the community that have donated uh, large quantities of medical supplies, and these we are very happy to receive. Uh, that brings to mind uh, right after the, about, I guess about the first two weeks after the occupation of the island, that the GSA and the Public Health Department made threats to remove us from the island because of improper sanitation facilities on the island. They made statements that they may have to remove us. And that kind of struck me as being rather funny because they let us live on reservations under the same circumstances and uh, they haven't threatened to improve these conditions or drag us off and make things better for us. But all of a sudden we're on this island and they want to do this for the people that are on the island and somehow I just don't think that uh, we would benefit all that much from it. Uh, Ray, what uh, is it like on your reservation at home? Um, yeah, well, my reservation is mentioned in uh, the New Indians and it's a small town, it's in a valley, it's a population of maybe a thousand. And we've got a state highway coming through, dividing the town into two. One side's uh, agency controlled, meaning they've got shutters and lawns and cars and sidewalks. And then on the other side, there's a craft cattle guard in between there. And on the other side, we've got the highway, then we've got the town, and above the town, we've got the we've got three main areas of where the people live. And so there's three groups, the Indians, and the Utahns people, and then the agency people. And there's a lot of, I guess what, fighting, I guess, among the agency kids and the Indian kids and the white kids. There was anyway, and now it's, you know, it's a little bit more co covert than it was. And we do have Indians who work for the BIA, and they stay on the agency side. And, you know, among all the Indians, it's, there's a current term called, well, it has been passed, called agency kids. You know, referring to the Indian kids who lived on the agency side, who are brown, or little brown Americans, essentially. You know, they have no culture, they don't associate with the Indians because the Indians are Indians, you know, whatever that connotes to them. And we have, what, about two gas stations, one store, about 12 religions, and one main street. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gabriel, would you uh, give us a little background on the reservation at your home? Uh, I'm from the Colorado River Reservation. It's uh, the jewel uh, along the Colorado River. It, it's, in a, it's a diamond shape, and it's just what it is. It's a jewel of land. It is one of the richest land bet between Phoenix and uh, the coast there, and uh, the Colorado River runs right through it. In fact, uh, some of the uh, California water that Los Angeles uh, drinks, uh, the population there, is from the Colorado River. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, and so we are right uh, below that aqueduct. And also above there is Lake uh, Havasu City. And uh, so, uh, you know, we could have our own city down there, and we're developing it down on that reservation. Now, in regards to the society there, uh, we have a uh, reservation town. Uh, uh, so many square miles was granted by Congress for, for a town. Town site was created there. And you have uh, non-Indians living there. And then you have the reservation group. And it seems to me that uh, we have different castes, caste system there, the white caste and the Indian caste system. But the Indian uh, group itself has broken down into two separate groups, those who believe in uh, the white society and those who don't. Those who don't uh, want to sing their own songs and go their own way and uh, they have to go on the California side to sing. So they gather there every Sunday and they sing songs. Um, this, this group of people are in terms of tribal government and we do have a tribal government there and a tribal council there. Uh, they don't, uh, they feel alienated, uh, they feel aloof and apart from the council. And this cr creates a, a problem there, and, uh, and, but it's still a potential. 
98% of the people in uh, our reservation spoke English in 1958. And right at this time, I imagine 100% uh, of them speak English. But we still have the same old problems. We're sti they're still poor Indians, and a whole lot of them. Uh, so learning English and going through college it doesn't mean a thing. It, it, at that point in time, when you have to re return back to the reservation, you're not in the in-group. Uh, uh, with a college education, one could be uh, the janitor over there on the reservation if you don't go with the don't follow the BIA policy or tribal policy, you know. So, uh, it's, but it's still positive. It's still a jewel. It's, it's still a land. And some of the other Indian people who really follow the Indian philosophy and the Indian way of thought are now beginning to get into the government. And so, um, this last uh, election last year, a year ago in uh, December, uh, fifty percent uh, of the council there uh, are were under the age of thirty five and we have a, a real young tribal council chairman there uh, but twenty seven years old and this is great uh, there 's a change coming and it 's going to be positive for our reservation but I think that we 're going to have to set up uh, an, um, <coughs> a cultural studies studying about ourselves and learning to talk our own language again over. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. I, I see that we're out of time for this part of the show, so we'll have to send this back to the local stations for about 15 minutes, and we'll return at 8. And I'd like to thank you, Stella and Gabriel and Ray, for being here and giving us your time. Okay, so we'll return at 8 o'clock. This is the Pacifica Network, and this is Pacifica Berkeley. KPFA and KPFB. This is Al Silverwoods, the station manager at KPFA, and I'm in the studio with John Adair, professor of anthropology at San Francisco State. Professor Adair, your major field of interest is Indian culture and anthropology, particularly with an interest in the Indians. Have you got any reactions to the occupation of Alcatraz and, and to what's been said so far this evening? Well, those that I've spoken with um, think that this is uh, is really a very significant event and one that um, uh, my friends have watched very carefully. Those of us in anthropology who have worked with American Indians in the past have, have been very much concerned with the fact that that while the federal government's heart might be in the right place, doing things for Indians is no answer at all. And the Indians have shown in their moving in on Alcatraz, that they intend to do things for themselves, and that's what's the really important thing. Well, I think that there may be a, a kind of over-familiarity with the horrifying statistics on the part of the young Indian people on Alcatraz, and, and that they don't lean on those in presenting them to our audience. Uh, I think there are many statistics and, and case histories and examples that could be given uh, the mortality rate significantly higher on reservations and things of this sort. Would you want to express some of those? Yes. Well, I don't have the statistics at hand. I could make some comments. The, uh, the, the health situation for the American Indian um, uh, nationwide has been deplorable. Uh, in some areas, since the um, uh, United States Public Health Service has taken over, some conditions have improved. Um, They've improved remarkably on the Navajo Reservation, which I am familiar with. On other reservations, I understand that they are still uh, way behind in terms of rendering a, um, an adequate health service. Uh, but um, beyond that, there are other things that should be pointed out. There are very few um, American Indian lawyers, for example. There are very few American Indian college professors. There are very few American Indian professionals although the Indians are coming into uh, professional ranks more and more every year. But um, they have been a people, as been, has been expressed by the Indians on Alcatraz that spoke this evening. Uh, there, there has been a, 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 an isolation of the Indians from the mainstream of American life. And, uh, and now that the Indians are living in by tens of thousands in American cities, as a matter of fact, Los Angeles, 
uh, and uh, Orange County have the largest Indian population, I believe, in the nation of any equivalent, um, of any comparable area. And um, Indians in cities, um, uh, is, is living in cities is something very new to Indians. And in the urban renewal, um, Indians frequently left out, get left out in the cold. And I might add uh, just uh, that, uh, uh, speaking of renewal, this seems to be on Alcatraz an Indian renewal. They want to find their own way of coping with the city and coping with conditions on their reservations from which they have been relocated. The figure is often given of about 600,000 as the Indian population in the United States. Uh, I realize or I understand that this figure may not be accurate because many uh, Indian people, uh, as with certain other segments of the population, uh, for example, young people who are designated as hippies, just do not get reflected in the census. They're not found. They're lost. Uh, but that figure of 600,000, even if we accept it as a kind of working hypothesis, what relation does that bear to the population of Indians, as anthropologists have been able to estimate it, uh, prior to the advent of the white man on this continent? Well, the, the Indian population in the last 50 years has been uh, very much on the increase, and it is getting up to and perhaps um, uh, will exceed uh, the, the aboriginal population. But the important thing is that at the present day, uh, the Indian populations all over the nation uh, are... Uh, are increasing very rapidly, and it's one of the most rapidly increasing populations in all of North America. But but it is significantly less, as I understand, than the number of uh, Native Americans or Indians that were here when, let's I, say, the, I, the first uh, people arrived from Europe. I'm sure that's true, but I, I can't uh, give you the statistics. All right. I, I, I assume that that was a significant uh, factor because uh, what that means is, of course, that the rate of attrition and death and destruction uh, which occurred uh, 100, 200, 250 years ago was a significant factor, I guess, in the, in the inheritance and memory and uh, legend structure and history of any individual Indian uh, who's alive today. Uh, correct. This is, this is one of the things that is in, in the mind of all of the American Indians. And another thing which was expressed uh, this, this evening by those out on Alcatraz was the, the importance of Indians studying about themselves, as was said, a, a chance to educate themselves as to what their Indian heritage is. Now, in certain areas of the country, um, the American Southwest, for one, the American Indians' culture is still very much of a going concern. Their religion is still with them, and they, they practice their religion in their daily life. Uh, their, their economics and, and their tribal structure and their social organization is still very much the way it, it was prior to the white man. But um, that's not so in, on the West Coast. It's not so on the East Coast and in, in uh, many other sections of the country. And there you find that the Indians are essentially looking for an identity, and it's an, an identity that has been lost. And they want to really know what, what their Indian ancestry, how they lived, and what their culture was. And, and that was said, and is said every day by American Indians, especially those living in cities. I, I have this reaction every once in a while to the conservationist actions on behalf of things such as redwoods and uh, uh, disappearing species of animals, uh, that they're very concerned about this, as indeed I think is a large proportion of the population, as I am myself. But at the same time, I recall the very interesting, fascinating book uh, called Ishi, which was a, a, really a description of the last remaining person from a tribal group, a group of human beings who inhabited, uh, lived in the state of California before the coming of Europeans, I suppose I should call them, because they were not all white, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I wonder about the feelings we have about the disappearance of intact, complete cultural groups, which has taken place in the past, groups of people who shall be no more, whose culture, whose human culture has completely disappeared except for artifacts. This, of course, is, is the case not only with American Indian, but it's true all over the world in, in uh, Southeast Asia, the mountain tribes, and in Africa. And wherever one would look at tribal life, one finds that with the passing of every year, uh, a significant number of cultures are, are lost from, from the world. 
the and that again I think is is the real significance of Alcatraz. The, the the American Indian does not want to be lost. He does not want to be swept into the mainstream of American society. They do not want to be homogenized, as they say. And um, and many anthropologists and many sociologists lately have, have realized the wisdom of their words in, in not wanting to get lost in the mainstream. What they need is their own thing and, and their own identity. I'd like to ask you briefly about the, the field of Indian studies as it's, uh, it occurs in anthropology or related fields. Uh, is that an area of interest amongst anthropologists and professional people in the academic field? Or is this something which has uh, gone into eclipse? I know there was a time somewhat earlier when this was considered uh, a basic, a basic uh, major field of study. The uh, American Indians, uh, as a, uh, I want to be sure that I have your question. Um, uh, is your question, is the American Indian as a subject in anthropology uh, still a, a, um, a going concern? Is, is that your question? Well, uh, really, I think a little broader than that. The field of Indian studies, which would be, of course, I think, include the earlier yeah. uh, study as well as the, the current situation. Well, the, I'll answer the question this way. The, uh, prior to this, the, the anthropologists um, and other social scientists were, were those who, from the outside, had a, a great interest in, in the nature of Indian culture. Uh, in in recent years, uh, American Indians themselves have wanted to be participants in this study. And I think this is a, a significant new movement in anthropology itself that's just getting underway, what one might call in-culture research. And this also has, a, of course, a great uh, educational value. Uh, many of the same um, uh, psychological characteristics that um, uh, and, and pedantic, uh, I, I mean to say, the, the problem of the educator. Uh, educating uh, various ethnic groups is, bears many similarities from one group to the next. And the American Indian, just as the, as the blacks feel that, they must, they must find out for themselves and they must do a good deal of writing about themselves. Now this is just getting underway among the American Indians. It was to a degree true in the 19th century. Many of the leading anthropologists in the 19th century were actually American Indians. Uh, but recently, more recently, that has not been the case. And now the American Indian wants to get back to write his own history. This is going on at Rough Rock, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation, where they are feeding back to the community and to the people the work of the anthropologists and interpreting that material in their own way. I think this is excellent. And the same thing goes in the classroom at San Francisco State or, or University of California at Berkeley or other places where uh, Native American studies are being taught. We've heard reference made to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and uh, otherwise known as BIA, and I'm sure that we will hear it again many times as these programs progress. Could you perhaps describe uh, what the Bureau of Indian Affairs is and a little bit of its uh, history and relationship with the Indian people, just even in general terms, so our audience may have that in, in its mind? Well, the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs... Uh, started out, I, I, I might add, in, in the War Department in, in the last century. Uh, it was transferred over to, to the Department of the Interior and uh, is a, a very large bureaucracy. It is a well-meaning bureaucracy. It has had some very brilliant leaders. Uh, John Collier Sr. was perhaps the most notable of any of the Indian commissioners. But there has the Department of the Interior has always had to be a defender of the American Indian against those who would make land claims against the American Indian and grab the land from, from, from him. And so the Department of the Interior has had a, a, a many different kinds of roles. And, and there has been, of course, in the past, in the distant past, uh, a good deal of corruption within the federal government. That has not been so in, uh, under the Collier regime and un, under, recent, uh, Indian, uh, under recent commissioners. But nonetheless, it is such an enormous bureaucracy that it is very difficult for the Indian to, get, to have his own voice heard. Even if an Indian commissioner is, even if an Indian himself is the commissioner, which is the, is the present case and, and uh, the case of the last uh, commissioner was also an American Indian. But the bureaucracy moves very, very slowly. 
and uh, it's, it's off in one little corner in Washington. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs does not lead to other kinds of career jobs in the American, uh, uh, in, the American uh, in the life of the American civil servant. It's a dead end, and very frequently uh, people just get lost in that bureau, and they, they do not become effective, and they become demoralized. The same thing goes for Indians who have joined the bureau. We've got about a minute more before we go back to Alcatraz, and I'd like to ask you as a concluding question uh, what your reactions are to the ideas that were pr promulgated uh, as far as the use of Alcatraz. For example, uh, the setting up of a Native American university. How do you react to that? I think that this is, is a, a marvelous idea. I would see no reason why that cannot be done and done effectively at, at Alcatraz, here in the middle of, a, of um, the Bay Area where there are excellent universities that have had a long interest in, in uh, ecology and in American Indian studies. What could be a better uh, site for such a university? And I think that the from what I know and from what the Indians have said this evening, they want to extend their, their services and their educational services back to their reservation. And um, speaking of ecology, I think this in itself is, uh, is, is another excellent thing about the, the, the takeover of Alcatraz by these Indians. Uh, it will be of great significance to see how they can relate to that environment and how they are able to improve that environment. And this is KPFA and KPFB. Pacifica Berkeley. This is the Pacifica Network. We now take you back live and direct via radio link to Alcatraz. Welcome back. This is Radio Free Alcatraz from Indian Land, Alcatraz Island in California. This is John Trudell speaking for the Indians of all tribes and for this portion of the show we have with us Mr. Richard Oakes, Ms. Lanata Means, and Mr. Earl Livermore. Richard Oakes, as many of you may know, is a Mohawk Indian from New York, the St. Regis Reservation, Quebec, Canada. He's a council member now. He was with the initial invasion, and he's also a San Francisco State College student. And Lenata Means is a Bannock Indian from Fort Hall, Idaho. And she's a college student also pre in pre-law at the University of California at Berkeley. And she was also one of the first 14 to land on the island. And we have also with us Mr. Earl Livermore, a Blackfoot Indian from Montana, who was just appointed coordinator for the Alcatraz movement. He's also the ex-director of the San Francisco Indian Center. He's an artist, and he has been with the movement from the start. And so the first question I'm going to lead off with, because Richard just mentioned it to me, is at this very moment, what are one of our most important needs on the island? Yes. Uh, at this moment, we need water. Water was our, uh, when we first came on, was one of our most outstanding problems, and it still is our problem now. We had, as of two days ago, uh, 25,000 gallons. Now it's down to uh, a critical level, and we're in dire need of water. Okay, so if there's anyone out here in the San Francisco area that can uh, give us a hand about getting some more water, we sure would appreciate it. Earl, uh, as an artist, what would you like to see develop with an art program on the island? Well, we're already in process of looking for a site to develop an art studies program. I've had a friend of mine uh, look at a site, and uh, we're thinking of starting a program immediately if we can get the art supplies out here on the island. We would like uh, to work toward developing a uh, culture center we know that there are a number of Indian art organizations throughout the country uh, that can help us uh, as far as getting uh, the art uh, to uh, to this to the area if we want a national art exhibit. Well, I think it's uh, to people that know anything about the Indian people that Indians are just as a, a race of people naturally artistic come out with many beautiful designs. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the boys that's here for the conference today that we held is, uh, spent the night at my house down here on the next level. And he did a painting this afternoon on the wall of an Indian riding a horse, and he did it in about an hour's time. You know, it's a very good job. He's never had any artistic training. And also, uh, 
There's a gentleman from Canada, his name is Alan Sapp, and he's a Cree Indian. And he has just, he's starting to get public attention now as an artist, and he is self-taught. He's, uh, his paintings are reaching the bracket now, the five, $500,000 bracket, so he's starting to get a move on in the art world. Uh, they had a showing for him in Los Angeles not too long ago, and I got to meet him, and he told me that he does all his paintings from memory, you know, just, just things that he doesn't use any models or anything, and he's a very capable artist. Uh, Lineda, I had, uh, what's this? Oh, being as you were one of the original 14 to come out here, one of the invaders, why did you join this movement? Well, I guess it's, it's a lifelong thing. You don't just, it's hard to say that you just jump into it and you join it. Uh, it's from, it's, it comes from way back from the reservation and the type the type of things you see your people going through, the type of things your family goes through. It's all affected me personally. And I guess that's why I went into the area that I did and where I'm going to major in law. I mean, I'm in pre-law now, but I'm going to go into law later on. It's, it's like I said, it just isn't something you jump into. It's something you've kind of grown up with. Richard, the same question to you. What uh, motivated you to join this movement? I have a similar answer to Lanita, <clears throat> in that uh, I was involved in the 1959 struggle on my own reservation, uh, trying to blockade the, uh, the, the building of the Long Sioux Dam, uh, the Seaway Project, which was taking parts of our reservation up there without compensation. Also building of a bridge uh, from the United States to Canada on the reservation and building facilities to uh, house the, the maintenance men in the various aspects of the bridge, all on Indian land without just compensation. So it's really been a, a deep part of me to uh, try to rectify some of these. Now we feel like we're in a position to, to uh, do something about it. Uh, yes, it seems to me that uh, the government has been practicing a policy of taking what they need from the Indian people, well, not necessarily what they need, taking what they want from us, just about any time that they would like to do so, and they've been doing this through the years, they're doing it today. And uh, I would say that a large majority of the people out in the average, the average American people don't, aren't even aware that this is going on. And maybe that's why this, the government is allowed to get away with this. Anyone care to? carry on with this? Yes, uh, presently you'll, you'll find that uh, up in the Nisqually Reservation that they're involved in a, a deep st uh, struggle with the fishing rights. But these people are actually trying to live uh, a quiet life and just trying to get two, uh, actually fish to feed the young people and the catch is only two percent. Now this isn't a heck of a lot to ask uh, uh, of the, uh, the people up there but it seems that uh, this is too much to ask for, uh, uh, from, uh, you know, of Indians to uh, whites. Uh, yes, I have this book of uh, Our Brother's Keeper, the Indian in White America, and it mentions here that in the state of Washington, that, this, that the state of Washington spends up to $2,000 per salmon, salmon to protect these fishing rights for commercial fishermen and tourists while they're taking them away from the Indian people. And uh, I believe there's something that's going to be going on about this, what, early in January? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, we're, we're working on plans to see if we can help out. As many of the people now understand that Alcatraz belongs, is not only here on the island, but it's a part of every reservation. It's a part of every person. And we're, we're going to do our darndest to try to rectify some of these mistakes. Well, we're going. Uh, I think we've got a good start. We've uh, we're showing that we we can get together. Like we have had the the conference today. And is there anything that uh, you can say about the conference that we had today, Earl? Yeah, well, I was really pleased uh, to see the turnout that we had for the conference because today it was just miserable out. It was raining, and 
number of people they turned out in this and they were uh, pitched right in and worked on the planning for the future of their island Alcatraz and uh, people have uh, sh should said that the island itself was nothing but a miserable rock but today it, it just seemed beautiful because of uh, the symbolism and unity that that was shown today and uh, people really are sincere and, and really want to make something of this island and it does have uh, wonderful possibilities for the Indian people in line of a culture <coughs> center and also because I work in the urban areas or I have had worked in urban areas and there is a definite need for say in line of health outpatient treatment and care in urban areas but yet there is uh, also the inpatient care uh, that is needed and perhaps could be worked out on the island along with uh, the great need of uh, doctors and nurses that uh, could very well work in the urban areas in which uh, we do have a lot of problems of getting these type of people to work on uh, the various programs rehabilitation or whatever so uh, I think that the island and is has great potentials for uh, the Indian people and it's about uh, about all I can like say right now in this Somebody else would like to comment on Lanita. Uh, <clears throat> well, like we just haven't had much of a chance in, well, like back on the reservation, uh, we've had problems, we've been fighting for a long time, but we've never really been recognized because of the dictatorship that we live under, like the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, the media is very unsympathetic. And it hasn't been until, like we've all been out on relocation, and the Bay Area has been a centralized point where I guess this was the biggest downfall of the relocation program because they didn't think that we could all get it together. And since we're all here from all different tribes, and we're, we're getting it together and we're, we're trying to do a lot of things, the media isn't, hasn't been that biased or prejudiced because, because They've never had to uh, put up with the type of bureaucracy that we've been put through back on the reservation. So it's really given us quite a bit of a chance, and Alcatraz has really been uh, a, a great opportunity for us to express uh, everything that we've been fighting for for a long time. I believe you mentioned the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Now, this is something I would like some reactions to hear from everyone. Uh, I disagree with many things that the Bureau of Indian Affairs does. The way that they've handled the Indian people, the way that they've treated the Indian people, like the fact that if there's one, one BIA official or worker for every 16 Indians in America, and I'd hate to have that ratio be one to 10 with the conditions that we're in today because it seems as though they're really, they don't care about us, but they're supposed to be set up to look out for us. And I get the general impression that the BIA is looking out for the BIA so that they can all have a place to retire after 20 years or 30 years or whatever they're, so they can draw their social security. Anyone care to comment? Well, the Bureau of Indian Affairs structure is such a structure that it doesn't service, let's make this one point clear, it does not service the Indian people. It provides a service for the federal government only. And as far as the average uh, age, you'll find that the people who are in the organization have been there for 23 years. The average age is around 40, 45, 49 years old. So, uh, I was, uh, I believe it was in one of the books about the, uh, well, my biggest gripe against the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I would say, would be the school system, because that is where I have come into contact with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, with, with their schools because when Indian schools were set up, this was all part of a program to break down the Indian people as a fighting unit. And they tried this in many ways through the religion and various other programs, but the Indian schools were also set up so that they forced Indian students to attend Indian schools, made them wear military uniforms and march, and made them accept the white way of life. They farmed out students to white people in the surrounding communities 
They, they farm these students out as servants in the summertime. They keep them away from their families. They, there are cases where they have withheld rations from reservation families if they didn't send their children to these schools. They build the schools great distances away from home. So an Indian student, uh, and this, this is true today, this part here where an Indian student has to travel anywhere from 100 to 1,500 miles away from his family to go to school. And I think that uh, while Sherman Institute in Riverside, California is one example, they didn't allow California Indians to attend the school until 1968. They took all their student enrollment from the, the southwest part of the United States, from Arizona and New Mexico, and I believe Nevada. And I think that it is wrong for them to do this today. Like, instead of building more of these schools, I think maybe they should improve living conditions at home so that the kids can stay with their families and go to school on their reservation. They should give us uh, something to identify with some background on ourselves in these schools, because I'm sure you're all aware of the Indian school in Idaho, I believe it was, that Robert Kennedy visited, and he asked to see the library, and there was one book on Indians in the library, and it was on the cover of cover of the book, there was a picture of an Indian scalping a white child. And so, I mean, this is, I really disagree with the BIA and their education setup because they, uh, the stress seems to be on giving us a trade and getting us off, off their hands, but they're not uh, stressing leadership qualities or higher education for us. I talked to a gentleman from the Riverside School and asked him what they were doing, what they had as a setup for their students to continue. Uh, on to four-year colleges to get degrees, learn a profession instead of just a trade. And he said, he told me that he thought it would be a waste of time to send these kids to college, that they should just get a job when they get out of school and go to work and become productive to society, I guess. Uh, now productive what, to what society? I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> well, you see, the situation is that it, the whole school system, the BIA school system, should be chucked should be shelved and restructured, but restructured in such a way that the Indian culture is revealed, so that the Indian person going to these schools, if their schools are still in operation, will get the knowledge and understanding of who he is, what he is, and why he's in that situation, as well as an understanding of the different Indians uh, surrounding him and the different Indians in the whole United States and Canada, Alaska. We have a great uh, history, and I think it should be brought forward. Uh, Lenata was in one of those schools, and I think Lenata can uh, talk better on it than I can. Yeah, well, I just want to say that, um, as he mentioned, uh, the school in Idaho, I went to school there. It, however, it was a public school on the reservation outside uh, in the na nearby neighboring town. Uh, I went to this high school, and it's typical of the of high school surrounding reservations, meaning that you don't have much of a choice as far as your education. Uh, the people who uh, are in charge of you, or your teachers, and all uh, teach things in their classes like uh, no Indians or dogs allowed. And when you're the only Indian sitting in the classroom, then it uh, really makes you feel bad. Or uh, uh, Indians are, you'd rather, what is that term, you better be dead uh, than an Indian or a good Indian is... A good Indian is a dead one. Uh, yes, I was, <laughs> I was in a classroom when the teacher said that and I, I nearly died of embarrassment, but I, I did say something about it and I got kicked out of the classroom and I had to go to the principal and they gave me a bad time there, then I eventually got kicked out of school and then from there on I was uh, too young to quit school and so my other alternative was to go to reform school. So with that choice then then they offered uh, BIA school so I said I'll go to the BIA school so I went to uh, South Dakota the first time which ended up to be a private Indian school and I had problems there with uh, the people trying to regiment the girls where we had classes that were actually just taking care of the headmaster and headmistress's home that they called uh, home ec, but was actually just being their personal maids and servants. So I got expelled from there and I, they sent me to Oklahoma, uh, Shilako Indian School, 
where I had problems there after about six weeks and they expelled me for inciting a riot, which wasn't like that either. It was, I was just speaking up for what I felt was right and I got kicked out again and then they sent me to a school in uh, Nevada. I went to Stewart Indian School and I couldn't get in there because my, I didn't have any records or something like that, so I got to, I went to Carson City High, and I went a half a day, but by then my records were so bad they, would, they expelled me in a half a day, and I had to go see the chief of police and the judge, and then they were ready to send me back to reform school again, so I just said, later, I've, I still have parents, I'll just go back to my reservation. After I got back to my reservation, and luckily enough, my parents were understanding they didn't denounce me in the way that the Bureau did or the rest of the people at the agency did, but they just said, well, I'm glad to know you're still, you know, you're still you. And I didn't know exactly what they meant at the time, but later on I found out that they meant, I'm glad you didn't get brainwashed. <laughs> so it, it was all um, part of the great de-indianizing process or brainwashing process that I went through. I went to... Uh, uh, they sent me out in the summertime to live in a white home where I earned five dollars a week as a personal maid and then the money was sent back to the school and the school never did accept me back so they they took all of that it was it was really uh it was really a hard blow on me psychologically i I never did finish school I went to the ninth grade or I completed the ninth grade after everything was added up and Yet I, I still didn't exactly want to quit there either, and that's when I came out on relocation to the Bay Area, and then I tried to get into the University of California where I was turned down. And then after a year or so with backing of some people in the Mission District of San Francisco, where most of the Indians are located or centralized now, then uh, I got in as a token Indian in the EOP program because they didn't have any Indians in. I summed it up pretty fast, but that was just a... That's a whole life story right there. It's, uh, no, not exactly. <laughs> well, even as a token, you got in as a token. The thing is, you got in, and so now we can get more of us in there. Duh. But they don't even give uh, other Indian students that, that much of a chance. I mean, you don't even get your foot in the door anymore. Well, we're going to have to change that. <laughs> Something has to be said about those... Uh, uh, Right now, there's a, a great many schools starting their Native American Studies programs. These Native American Studies programs are still skeleton structures. They still are uh, not, they, they aren't the answers, you know, uh, for the education. The answers, the, some of the, the actual material has to be gathered from the fields. I'm talking about the reservations so that they can be incorporated into a school system, so that they can be put into a workable curriculum, so that the individual can learn and profit. And in turn, when a person gets his degree, he can return to the reservation and use this knowledge. It then takes the form of useful knowledge of which he can service his people, his or her people. It's, uh, I know while I was going to college in San Bernardino, I never, American history was a required subject, and I didn't graduate from San Bernardino. And one of the many reasons, but one, uh, an important reason to me was I never took American history, because I didn't feel that I should have to take this, this history class that gave no identification to the Indian people. It, uh, because there are many important things that we have contributed to the American society and without Indian, without the Indian people around or if we, if the, early, the Indians uh, that were around Plymouth Rock had wanted to make things difficult for the first pilgrims and people to come over, they sure could have done it. it uh, the white civilization that came over, we had our civilization here and we, we trusted them and uh, they kind of, uh, we thought that they would be like us, and then we found out that they weren't, and we've been finding that out ever since. You know, there's a lot of shams that have been perpetuated against the American Indians, some of them right, right quite recently. <clears throat> this Alcatraz movement 
has inspired a lot of people to sort of make, it's a quick buck thing if, if, uh, for, for some of these promoters. What I'm talking about is we on Alcatraz are denouncing the Indian Creek celebration, which is supposed to take place the 26th to 27th.